Um, so, um, the conference had randomness in mathematical physics in its title, so my talk today will be about a problem from mathematical physics where you can use randomness or probability theory to advance, you know, what was known before in mathematical physics and PDs about the problem. Okay, so the plan for the talk is uh, uh, I'll give you a bit of historical background and motivation for the super cool Stefan problems, a topic of my talk, and uh, Stefan problems you know, in general. And so um, what I will try to explain is that um, even though the problem is a PD problem from the mathematical perspective, there is sort of a natural barrier to how far you can go with PD techniques. And so the main message will be that you know, there is a probabilistic formula, reformulation of the problem which allows you to go beyond that barrier and uh, in particular allows you to construct global solutions of, of this problem, whereas before only local solutions uh, were considered. And so, you know, the main part of the talk I will sp spend on explaining uh, that these global solutions actually exist. So it's really not a vacuous class of objects we're talking about. And then uh, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the structure of the solutions and, and also a little bit about the existence proof. And I should also mention, so this is based on a sequence of three papers. Uh, the first two are joint work with Sergei Natoshi, and the third one is joint with Francois Delarue and uh, Sergei Natoshi. Okay, so let's get started. So uh, Stefan problems, as uh, some of you may know, you know, a very classical uh, topic in mathematical physics, so they were introduced by Stefan in the late 19th century. And so um, if you read German, th these are actually extremely entertaining uh, papers to read, so um, I definitely recommend to look at least at the introduction uh, of these papers. And so if you look at the first paper from 1889, uh, what Stefan was interested in is the formation of ice in the Arctic Sea. And so in particular, he writes that, you know, he, he was worried about uh, too much ice forming in the Arctic, so it will be kind of hard for ships to, to sail through. And so he wanted to kind of mathematically model uh, the, this behavior, so how ice, or, you know, icebergs are, are forming in the ocean. And, and so he wrote down a, a free boundary problem which uh, describes uh, this behavior. And then he actually realized that there is nothing special b about the phase transition from, uh, from water to ice. And so in the subsequent papers, he looked at other phase transitions, uh, so, so evaporation and condensation and, and so on. And so kind of in the style of 19th century, he wrote down various explicit solutions uh, for the Stefan problems so for the free boundary problems he has formulated. And as it sometimes happens in science, so somehow uh, his work was thoroughly forgotten and you know, barely cited for 40 years until uh, Brillois gave a talk about it at the Institute Henri Poincaré in Paris in, in 31, and then somehow you know, the subject went through the roof. So, um, if you look at uh, the book by Rubinstein uh, from 67 on uh, Stefan problems, uh, he says that you know, even the book is not long enough to cite all the papers uh, that were written on the subject and that he estimates that there are around 2,500 papers uh, written on Stefan problems uh, by the 60s. So of course, you know, I will not give you an overview of these uh, 2,000 papers. But uh, there is some consensus um, that this paper uh, by Kamina Mostkaya from 61 is, you know, in some sense, you know, the final solution uh, and sort of the end of the subject in the sense that uh, she managed to construct generalized solutions 
of Stefan problems in any dimension for any number of phases, and she gives existence, uniqueness, and also a numerical schemes, so in a sense, you know, everything you might want to know about Stefan problems. So what I will talk about today is a different regime uh, of the Stefan problem, namely uh, the so-called supercooled regime. So what it means is that uh, the liquids in my talk will be supercooled. And what it, what it really means is that you, you take a liquid, for example, water, and you cool it below its freezing temperature. So for water below zero Celsius, but in such a way that uh, your liquid still remains liquid, that it does not freeze. So it stays in this metastable uh, liquid state, even though the temperature is below the freezing point. And then somehow the behavior of these uh, supercooled liquids is very different from the behavior of regular liquids. And rather than telling you in words, I'll show you a quick video uh, of that. So let's see if it loads. Great, so what you will see in the video is supercooled water, which is poured into a glass. And uh, I emphasize that the video is in real time before I show it. Okay, so here it goes. So take super cold water, you pour it, and then this happens. So you see, you know, the freezing, the phase transition goes on, you know, extremely fast. You see this almost instantaneous freezing. And so, you know, what we will want to understand in the stock is, you know, how to mathematically you know, models this kind of behavior. So this, you know, very fast advancement of the frontier between the ice and the water and how you can study this phenomenon uh, mathematically. Okay. All right, so mathematically, kind of in a nutshell, uh, what this behavior uh, translates to is that uh, the problem will have blow-ups. And so um, this was first observed by Sherman in the 70s. And uh, so what it means is that there will be uh, finite time points at which the speed the ice is advancing will become infinite. And so kind of the main message of the talk will be that you can go beyond these blow-up times, so you can construct global solutions of the problem even beyond the time where the rate at which the ice is advancing in the video becomes infinite. All right, so after this introduction, let me jump into the math. Uh, so I'll first uh, draw a picture and then explain uh, the supercool Stefan problem in formulas. So what we will look at uh, in this talk will be the so-called one-dimensional, one-phase Stefan problem. So what it means is the following. So we have, let me draw time horizontally and space vertically. And so initially you imagine that you have water or some other supercooled liquid sitting on the positive half line. And if you like, you can think of putting ice uh, or, or the corresponding solid state of your liquid uh, on the negative half line at time zero. And what will happen is that as time evolves, as in the video, the ice will advance, so more and more ice will be forming, and you know, less and less water will, will be left. So we will see some kind of frontier between uh, the two states. And what we will want to understand is how this frontier is advancing. So in the video, how the ice is kind of moving from right to left. Okay, so uh, how does, how the models this, how do you write the mathematical equations for this? Well, in this uh, uh, region above the frontier where you have the water, you just, uh, uh, you're just solving the heat equation. So uh, heat just propagates through the water according to the one dimensional heat equation. Uh, as long as you're looking above the frontier that I will always call lambda of t. And then there is a kind of coupling effect. So 
um, the way this frontier is advancing is related to the gradient of the temperature uh, next to the frontier. So that's uh, the second equation. So, so the derivative of this uh, non-decreasing function is some um, physical proportionality constant, capital C times the derivative of the temperature distribution in the water at the frontier. So right at um, the point where the ice and the water meet. And you have uh, kind of natural boundary conditions. So at time zero, you start with some initial temperature distribution. The prime means derivative with respect to? Sorry? The prime means derivative with respect to? With respect to time here. So lambda is just a function of time. So that's, uh, yeah, so just the slope of, of this frontier. Um, right, and so, so you have natural initial and boundary conditions here. So initially, you have some temperature distribution in the water that they call uh, little f. And uh, so the one phase feature of the problem means that you impose a constant temperature at the boundary here. So really, you imagine, you know, instead of putting ice, you imagine that you have some way of maintaining uh, a constant temperature um, at, at uh, the boundary here. So that's this uh, Dirichlet boundary condition um, that you see in the third line. All right, so now what makes this problem super cool are the signs of uh, these two quantities, C and little f. So if uh, C and f have opposite signs, you're back in the classical Stefan problem. Um, but here for us, they will have the same sign. So, you know, in terms of kind of the physical nature of the problem, both of them would be negative. So you, if, you have, if you think of water, its temperature would be below zero. But uh, mathematically, you know, it just matters if the signs are the same or different. So uh, for convenience, I will make both F and C non-negative rather than both negative. All right, and so uh, as I mentioned before, so it has been already observed in the 70s that this problem has uh, blow-ups. And what it means is that you can start with perfectly nice initial conditions little f, so f could be compactly supported and c infinity. And nonetheless, you will find uh, time points, so finite times capital T, so that the derivative, so the slope of this frontier, will become infinite as you approach this time point capital T. Okay, and so kind of the natural thing to do, and this was done in the PD literature extensively, is to say, well, okay, so we have this blob time, so let's look at the solution up to that time, so just on the interval from zero to this time capital T, and let's construct a solution at least until the time of blob. And in fact, so in, in one dimension, you can even construct a classical solution of this problem. In, in higher dimensions, you have to look for, for some you know, generalized notions uh, of solutions. All right, and so the main message today will be that you can go beyond this time capital T by looking at the probabilistic version of the problem. Okay, so where is the probability here? So let's uh, consider the following probabilistic problem, which uh, you know a priori may seem completely different from what I discussed before. So what you have here is um, a, a stochastic process, which you start from some initial condition y0 bar. So y0 bar is given to you. B is a Brownian motion, so that's also an input. So you have a Brownian motion from some initial condition. And the task in this probabilistic problem is to find a non-decreasing function capital lambda, so that the following is true. So you take your Brownian motion, you subtract this non-decreasing function, so you get you know, some stochastic process by bar, and now you follow this process until the time it hits zero. Okay, and your task is to find uh, a function uh, capital lambda in such a way that if you look at the probability that you hit zero before time t, this probability is proportional to lambda itself. 
So you can think of this as a fixed point that type problem. So you can try different lambdas uh, and you have to close this uh, fixed point constraint. Okay, so, so, so this is you know, some other mathematical problem. How does it relate to Stefan problems? Well, suppose that you find a nice function, capital lambda with a described property. So imagine that lambda prime exists, say as a continuous function, for example. Um, then of course, your process y bar here is just a Brownian motion with drift. And so if you look at the one dimensional distributions of this process, so the fixed time distributions, they will evolve according to the forward Kolmogorov equations. So um, they will follow a heat equation with a first order term that contains the drift uh, lambda prime. And uh, you know, naturally you will have an initial condition, uh, right, which is the density of this uh, random variable y0. And uh, you will have a Dirichlet boundary condition because your process is absorbed at zero, so that imposes uh, this boundary condition here. Okay, and so then kind of a nice exercise in stochastic calculus that I like to put on my final exams in Princeton is to show that um, if you um, look at uh, this process, the, the second condition can be translated into uh, this equation here. So in other words, what I'm saying is that the density of the heating time of zero can be expressed in terms of the first order derivative of uh, the fixed time distribution uh, at the absorbing point. So that's kind of a well-known fact in stochastic calculus. And so you, you translate the second equation into this uh, differential equation here. All right, and so once you have done that, you, you have a PDE problem which looks a bit similar to the Stefan problem, and it turns out all you have to do is to make a change of variables. So really what this P is describing is just um, the temperature distribution in the water from the point of view of the frontier. So all we did, so to go between P and the solution U of the Stefan problem is a, a, a change of coordinates. So P describes the temperature distribution if you think of the frontier as the point zero in space. And so if you make the change of variables back, you know, according to this formula, you, you can easily check that U will solve the supercooled Stefan problem. Okay, so it's a reformulation. And so what is great about this reformulation is that the quantity lambda prime, which is supposed to blow up, actually never appears, right? So if you look at this problem, so this, these two equations, they are formulated in terms of lambda itself. So the derivative does not even show up. And also this change of variables involves lambda itself, so the frontier itself, rather than the rate of freezing. And therefore, um, you may be able to extend your solution beyond the blow-up time, right? So we can introduce a notion of global solutions to the super cool Stefan problem by saying that, well, we're looking for capital lambdas solving this probabilistic problem. And once we have solved this problem, we will make this uh, change of variables down here. And this is what we will call a global solution of the super cool Stefan problem. Now you may ask yourself, okay, is this somehow a physical solution? So does it make sense physically? And the answer is yes, but you have to impose an additional condition, and uh, I'll come to that a little bit later. So, uh, in short, yes, you know, you will, the solutions you will construct will have physical meaning. All right, so now I will get kind of into the main part of the talk. So, um, you know, for, for the next uh, maybe 20 minutes or so, I'll try to convince you that these global solutions actually exist. Right, so um, it, it's a new notion of solution. So maybe you know there will be no such functions capital lambda with the described properties. And once we have existence, I'll tell you more about how these solutions look like and explain you know how you can even get uniqueness uh, of these solutions. All right, so um, we have by now two proofs of existence. 
But you know, since this is a probability conference, I will choose the more probabilistic proof. Now, from the probabilistic perspective, you know, if you want to show existence for, for some limiting equation for some PD, one natural way to proceed is to find you know, some discretization of the problem. So you know, typically, we find some kind of interacting particle system that uh, describes the microscopic dynamics uh, behind the PD. And then use a tightness argument, right? So you, you, we will cook up a sequence of particle systems which uh, in the hydrodynamic limit are supposed to give the right PD. And if we can show that subsequential limits uh, of these particle systems exist and are actually solutions of the limiting equation, then we prove the existence. So that's exactly how we will proceed. Now, for us, it was convenient to use a particle system that lives in continuum space to, to use tools from stochastic calculus. But since uh, many people here prefer discrete probability, let me give you first a discrete version of the particle system, which uh, uh, you, know, you could have also used to, to prove existence, just that, in my opinion, it's a bit less convenient. Okay, so. Uh, you can think of the following discretization of the limiting problem. So now we'll draw space horizontally here. And uh, imagine the following particle system. So you're on the non-negative integer lattice um, in, in space. At zero, you have you know, the initial location of your frontier, so again, you know, you can think of having ice to the left of zero and water to the right. And uh, now we'll put particles on these different sides of Z plus. There is no exclusion constraint, so you have, you can have multiple particles uh, per side. And uh, the dynamics of the particles will go as following, so we, we think of them as sort of infinitesimal you know, bits of heat in our heat equation. So these particles will do just simple random walks. So they will jump to the left or to the right with probability one half with no interaction whatsoever um, as long as they're to the right of the frontier. So initially, we just have independent, simple symmetric random walks. Uh, and so the interesting feature will kick in when one of the particles, let's say this one, reaches the frontier. And so what we will imagine is that if um, a particle reaches the frontier, it is absorbed. So you know, a little bit of water is absorbed into the ice, if you like. And the frontier you know, absorbs this particle and gets a, a unit of fuel and advances by one to the right. So if, you know, this particle here jumps to zero, the particle dies and the frontier moves up from zero to one. But, you know, if as in this picture, it encounters another particle here, it will absorb that particle as well and get another unit of fuel so it will advance actually to the point two, and then it would stop. Um, and then the process continues. So you have you know, these, all these other particles. So these other particles will continue as independent random box. And again, you know, if a particle lands on the frontier, it will absorb it and, and advance by one. And if there is a whole block of particles, it will absorb all of them and advance you know, as far a, a, as the block goes. Um, okay, so this uh, particle system I should mention was introduced by Amir Dembo and Li Cheng Tsai uh, in parallel uh, to our work, but for completely different purposes. So they were, in fact, not interested in the Stefan problem uh, as described here, but in certain uh, critical phenomena of this particle system. Anyway, so. Um, Right, so, so that's uh, their particle system. So for the purposes 
uh, of our papers and this talk, I will use a different particle system, which uh, will have the advantage to immediately live on continuous space, and therefore, you know, somehow when we will take the limit, it will be easier because you don't have to rescale the lattice you're already in continuum. Okay, so our particle system, you know, in a sense, is a continuous space version of what I have described, and it goes as follows. So initially, uh, we will place n particles on the positive real line, so they will have no real valued locations. Instead of the random walks, we will have independent standard Brownian motions, so our particles will start to diffuse independently, and um, there will be no interaction whatsoever until particles reach zero on the absorption threshold. And so, uh, you know, instead of thinking about the frontier advancing, I will think about, uh, again, this point of view of the frontier, so I will always absorb at zero and rather shift the particle configuration instead of advancing the frontier. So I will have this independent standard Brownian motions, and when the Brownian, motions, Brownian motion hits zero, I will shift the rest of the particle configuration towards zero. Okay, so let me uh, explain this in formulas. I think this will be clearer. So the locations of the particles will just evolve as independent standard Brownian motions as long as nobody hits zero. And so something interesting will only happen at these times to i when the particle actually does reach zero. And in this case, the following will happen. So we um, take this quantity here. So there are uh, two ingredients uh, into this quantity. So C is the same positive constant that appeared in the Stefan problem. And S T minus will be um, the size of, uh, so the number of particles still alive, you know, right before time little t. Okay, so if uh, a particle hits zero at time little t, the particle itself will be absorbed, and we will shift the remaining particle configuration towards zero by this amount here. And the interesting feature uh, of the system is that the shift can be large enough so that more particles are forced across zero instantaneously. And so you could have you know, this whole wave uh, of absorption. So, so your first particle has hit zero. You have shifted the configuration. Now imagine you have k more particles that were forced across zero. And if that happens, we declare those as absorbed or dead and remove them. And the remaining particles will now shift by different amounts. So we update the shift from this initial formula to this new formula down here, where the one standing for the one particle being absorbed is now replaced by k plus one. So we take the original one particle and the k particles absorbed kind of in this first, you know, in this, say, additional wave of absorptions, shift the rest of the configuration by this new amount, but this amount is larger, so you may force now additional particles to cross zero, in which case we update the k plus one to this new number of you know, as many particles as we're now absorbing, and we keep going until this cascade is resolved, meaning that we will choose you know, the smallest number, k plus one here, so that if we shift the configuration by this amount, the rest of the particles, so all the particles except the k plus one bottom ones stay above zero, right? So, so the important point to remember for, for the rest of the talk is that uh, we use this minimality convention that we always remove the smallest number of particles so that the rest survives, so that the rest, you know, even after the shift by this, stays above zero. Any questions about this setup? Uh, so it's po no, that's perfectly possible. So it's possible that at some point in time you will just remove everybody, and then the game is over. Yes. Uh, uh, this model doesn't distinguish super cool and uh, normal rigidity. 
so this model, it does distinguish the two regimes because, uh, right, so, so it does distinguish because uh, we use, so we crucially use the fact that C and F are both positive because F for us is the initial density. So you're gonna, you know, in the lim it will be kind of the limit of the particle density that you see on the lattice, or, or in our case, on the positive half line. So it has to be non-negative. And it's important that C is positive because otherwise you would be shifting particles away from zero. So, so this, this would change the game also. So, so it's, um, right, so, so the super cold feature is, you know, from this probabilistic notion of, of probability density at, at time zero and, and from the fact that you shift towards you. All right, so, so, so that's, um, you know, the particle system that we propose. And of course, um, um, let me jump here. So of course, uh, what I want to argue is that in the hydrodynamic limits and the limit as you uh, let the number of particles go to infinity, um, I, I will want to say that the um, empirical measure of this particle system will converge to the solution of the limiting problem. And this will give us uh, existence. Okay, so now um, to, to justify why you would even expect a limit as the number of particles becomes large, uh, I, I have to walk you through this little computation in the middle of the slide. Okay, so, so what is this computation? So you start on the left with this formula, which just describes the total amount of shift towards zero a particle experiences up to time little t. Okay, so, so let me explain the notation. So S u minus, as I mentioned before, is the number of particles right before the cascade at time u. du is my notation for the number of deaths or absorptions at time u. And so, you know, just from the definition of the particle system, at any time u, so if there are any particles dying, then the rest of the configuration is shifted uh, by this quantity here. Right, so now I will rewrite this quantity in a different way. So I'll first find the common denominator inside the log, so that's SU minus, and uh, then in the numerator we'll get the difference of SU minus and DU. So that's the number of survivors right up to time U minus the number of absorptions at time U, but this difference is just the number of particles that make it beyond time U that survive the cascade at time u. And now if you look at this formula, so the log of this ratio is really the difference of the logs. And so what is written here is really a telescoping sum. So all the terms will cancel out, except for the very first denominator, which is the initial size of the system, so that's capital N. And the very last numerator, which is the number of particles that make it beyond time t. But uh, this quantity is st, you can rewrite as a sum of indicators, right? You just count how many particles made it beyond time t. And so if you rewrite uh, the aggregated shift this way, you realize your particle system is actually of mean field or, or makin vlasov type, meaning that um, the interaction term can be written as a functional just of the empirical measure of the system. So the only way a particle feels uh, the presence of other particles is only through this empirical average of survival probabilities. And, and so um, that's nothing else but the integral of some functional with respect to the empirical measure of the system. So the measure that puts mass one over n on the trajectories of the different particles. And so whenever you have a mean field, um, mean field interaction, uh, we have a, a well-known heuristic, usually known as the mckin vlasov heuristic, which says that yes, you should expect a limit as the number of particles becomes large. And what should happen is, um, so first of all, propagation of chaos. So you, you, you expect that the interaction is very weak. So as n becomes large, your particles will become asymptotically independent. And uh, as a result of that, these uh, empirical averages will converge to the, you know, in this case, 
so, so to the corresponding expectation, as in the law of flash numbers, and in this case, the corresponding expectation is just the survival probability of a typical particle. So let me skip this slide and just jump to the limits. So um, if, if you believe in the McKean Vlasov heuristic, you arrive uh, at the following conjectured limits. So a, a typical particle in a system with you know, a large number of particles is supposed to behave as a Brownian motion because uh, in my system, particles are driven by Brownian motions. And this uh, empirical average, uh, so the C log of the empirical average of survival indicators should converge to C times log, just this times this, uh, sorry, log of the survival probability of a typical particle in the system. So you arrive you know, up to this log here, you arrive uh, exactly at the probabilistic formulation of the super cool Stefan problem. And you can also build a similar particle system where there is no log, but the computation I, sh I showed you with the telescoping sum would become a little bit more complicated. So, so, so I, I, for simplicity, I, I introduce this log here. Okay, so um, now typically what happens in this kind of problems is that you have, you know, from some PD results or, or, or from some uh, analytic techniques, you, you get uh, existence and uniqueness for the limiting problem. And so if you can establish some kind of tightness estimate for your particle system, you, you can deduce that uh, you know, along subsequences you have to converge. And so if the limit points solve the limiting problem, you get convergence of the whole sequence to the unique solution of, of the limiting problem. Now here, when, when you start thinking about this problem, you run into two issues that seem to be kind of uh, terrible, right? So you, first you run into non-existence. So let me tell you what I mean by that. So if you, you know, think about this problem, right? So your input is a Brownian motion and you look for this, again, uh, monotone function capital lambda so that the survival probability of this process is related to lambda itself. Now your input is a continuous process, a Brownian motion, so naturally you would try to look for a continuous function, capital lambda, that solves the problem. And so what I mean by non-existence is that you can uh, cook up a very simple you know, two-line argument saying that uh, you know, for perfectly nice initial conditions, you will not be able to find uh, a continuous function solving the system of equations. And um, what I'm saying here is more than what uh, you know, the PD literature was saying. So I'm not only saying that the derivative of lambda, lambda prime, has to blow up, but I'm actually saying that lambda itself will have a discontinuity point. So it must have a jump even for perfectly nice initial conditions. Okay, so that's non-existence, but well, uh, as a prob probabilist, and there is no significant issue here, right? So you couldn't find a continuous solution. So we go to our favorite uh, score hot space D instead of the space of continuous function C. And then indeed you can hope to find the solution in the score hot space of so functions that have uh, that the right continuous with left limits. Okay, now so you have some hope for existence but then you run into this non-uniqueness problem. So you realize quickly by constructing count examples that you know, once you allow for these discontinuous functions, capital lambda, there are actually multiple solutions for the same initial condition. And the reason for that is already embedded in the particle system. So the reason is that if you write the aggregated shift towards zero, in this uh, forms, in the form of this average, you quickly realize that, you know, in this formulation, there, there's already non-uniqueness for the particle system. So in other words, if you write the shift this way, it does not uniquely encode the cascades. It does not uniquely tell you which particles will be absorbed, or how many particles will be absorbed at, at any given time. And remember, in the particle system, we had this minimality condition, right? So I was saying that we always absorb the smallest number of particles so that the rest 
of the configuration survives. And so what you have to do in the limit is something very similar. So you have now this continuum density. So think of a continuum of particles. And basically what you have to impose is again a minimality condition that at any given time when you have a discontinuity, meaning that you're, you're shifting even your continuous configuration towards zero, you always want to shift by the smallest amount so that the rest survives. And so, you know, it's this slightly ugly looking formula down here. So you impose this minimality condition and now you can even hope for uniqueness. Okay, so let me present you now the various results. So the first result that, that we proved with Sergey uh, two years ago is the existence result. So it says that indeed um, the sequence of particle systems as n becomes large is tight and every limit point is indeed a global solution of the super cool Stefan problem. So in particular, these uh, global solutions actually do exist. Okay, so that's uh, result number one. Um, let me not go into this technical point and rather tell you more about the solutions. Okay, so what I just told you is that there are these global solutions, but the frontier between the water and the ice has discontinuities. So it has these jump points from time to time. Okay, so what uh, you would like to understand is, uh, of course, you know, how these discontinuities arise and maybe more precisely what the sizes of these jumps will be. And this is also crucial if you want to have uniqueness. So if at the end of the day you want to show that this global solution with the additional minimality constraint is actually unique. Okay, so to, to get there, you know, the simplest question you may ask is the following. So, you look at the first time of a discontinuity and you can ask yourself, what is the temperature distribution? How does the temperature distribution in the water uh, have to look like so that you run into this discontinuity? So what is happening in your liquid which leads to the jump uh, of the frontier? And that's what uh, the next result is about. But you know, to get to that, uh, I have to tell you a little bit about this first part of the solution, so what happens before the discontinuity. Okay, so to contrast the discontinuous part with that. Okay, so in this, uh, you know, regular behaved part, the following is going on. So remember, we're looking for some function to add to Brownian motion uh, to, uh, uh, so that the resulting process, you know, closes some fixed point constraint. Now, in this regular part, what you can try to do is to actually add a, a differentiable uh, process to your Brownian motion. So instead of looking for, for the frontier itself, for capital lambda, you can look for its derivative, which I called here little lambda. And then your problem becomes the following. So you're adding the integral of little lambda, which is the same as capital lambda. And the fixed point constraint I had before, I just took the time derivative of that. And so this little lambda has to correspond to the time derivative of the survival probability of your process, right? So you want to find now little lambda so that this process has a survival probability related to little lambda itself. And so indeed, you know, by using PDE techniques, you can show that uh, this quantity exists, for example, as an L2 function. So more specifically, you can show that at least on a small time interval, uh, you will be able to find an L2 function little lambda solving uh, this problem here. And, um, you know, I will not tell you much about the proof really, but, you know, the, the one uh, equation I want to show, which will be important, is this first equation here. So what you do is before you, you, you say, well, if uh, capital lambda has a derivative, then we're really talking about a Brownian motion with drift. So we can in encode the evolution of the temperature distribution uh, uh, by a forward Kolmogorov equation. So that's this equation here. And naturally it has a Dirichlet boundary condition, right? Because you're absorbing and so absorption corresponds to the Dirichlet boundary condition. And so you study this problem. So you, you, you 
you know, think of taking a guess for your little lambda, solving this equation, and then you want to check if you are satisfying this constraint or not. And so, you know, you can think of various ways of proving that this mapping uh, will have a fixed point. Okay, so that's the regular part. Now comes the more exciting uh, irregular part where really probability kicks in. Okay, so again, the question is, what is happening in the water that leads to this jump of the frontier between the ice and the water? And the answer is that, you know, at this uh, first jump time, the directly boundary condition, which uh, um, I, I was just describing, will be violated. So as you approach this jump time from the left, your density, right, or your, your temperature distribution, which, you know, in this regular regime, obeys the Dirichlet boundary condition. So this is now space, right, and I'm drawing the temperature distribution, or in probabilistic terms, the particle density. It uh, is zero at zero. But as you approach the jump time, what happens is that there will be a jump in the temperature at the frontier, so this density will change to a density which, say, looks like this, and in particular is not zero at the frontier. Okay, and moreover, so what we can say is that you can identify a critical threshold of one over capital C, so remember, capital C was the parameter in the problem, which uh, determines if you will have a discontinuity of the frontier or not. So, so you, as you approach this time t delta, you, so the um, particle density at the frontier becomes non-zero, but it may be above one over C or below one over C, and what the theorem is saying, you know, slightly simplified, is that um, if you're above one over C, you will see a discontinuity of the frontier, and if you're below one over C, you will not. And in fact, you can even identify what happens exactly at one over C, but I, I will not go into that right now. Okay, so that's uh, how you describe these discontinuities, and in fact, you can give exactly the size uh, of the discontinuity in the frontier in terms of the behavior of this density near zero. Okay, so that's the second main result. And so the last result I want to present is about uniqueness uh, of uh, solutions. So you can ask yourself, well, so now we understand these discontinuities, we understand the regular regime, maybe we can actually say the solution is unique and you know, there is a unique way of going through this regular part and a unique way of choosing the discontinuities. Now it turns out that uh, things are a little bit more complicated than that. Okay, actually they're much more complicated than that. So the issue is that there are really three regimes rather than two. Okay, so it's not only the case that you either have a differentiable boundary of frontier or jumps, so that, and you just alternate between the two, that there is a third possibility and it comes from this kind of picture. So it comes from these situations where your particle density becomes positive at zero, but stays below the threshold of one over C. And so in terms of this frontier, I don't write here, um, the third regime, uh, means the following, so you, you, you start kind of, kind of in this nice regime where your boundary is differentiable. Now, what can happen is that the derivative uh, of this boundary of frontier will become infinite, but the frontier remains continuous. So you can have, you know, also blow-ups of this form where you have this infinite slope, but still no discontinuity. And the third case is that you do have a discontinuity, as I have just described. And so to get uh, uniqueness of the solution, you need to understand all of these three regimes. So the perfectly regular one, 
the intermediate one where you are continuous but not differentiable, and also this irregular one. And it turns out the intermediate regime is actually by far the hardest, and that's kind of the core uh, of this paper with uh, Sergei and Francois, so the third paper in the sequence is really to understand the intermediate regime. And basically, at the end of today, you, you, you're always in one of these three cases. So at any given time, if you look at the temperature distribution in the water, so that's just this density f of my random variable, there are three situations. So either it is zero at zero and you know, well behaved near zero, in which case you have this continuously differentiable frontier, or it's your, your particle density or your temperature distribution gives you a positive temperature uh, at this uh, threshold, but below one over C. In this case, what you have to do is to figure out you know, what is exactly the regularity of this frontier, and so what you get is uh, Hölder continuity estimates. So your frontier will be always at least one half Hölder continuous, and it will be slightly better than that, so it will be one half plus delta Hölder continuous, and this delta will go to zero as you approach this point one over C. So it will depend on really where you are below this critical threshold. And then the third case is the irregular behavior when your density is above one over C and you get a discontinuity that, that you can phrase in terms of the density. So once you can analyze all of these three cases, you're actually in good shape for uniqueness. So you know, at this point, you can prove that there is actually a unique solution, unique global solution of the super cold Stefan problem. But you know, it's unique once you impose the minimality constraint on the sizes of these discontinuities, as described before. And so in reality, the proof uh, goes as follows. So we introduce a notion also of a maximal solution rather than minimal. And so maximal solutions have the property that they always bound, so, so they're always larger than minimal solutions, as you would expect from the name. And really, the uniqueness arguments at the end of, argument at the end of the day is uh, uh, sandwiching. So you take your minimal solution, it's bounded above by a maximal solution. But on the other hand, you can cook up a maximal solution from a shifted initial condition, which will be below your minimal solution. And so you, you, you kind of carefully close the sandwich, so you, you, you squeeze in your minimal solution between these two maximal ones which are unique for, for much simpler reason, and you get uniqueness of the minimal solution this way. Okay, so I think I'm out of time. So let me stop here, and thank you for your attention. Uh, can you extend this model or the analysis to two dimensions? Because this is a one-dimensional model. Right. Uh, one dimensional interacting particle system, et cetera. Can you do this in 2D? Uh, so that's, of course, a very natural question. And the answer at this moment is no. So we use kind of a lot of comparison arguments and monotonicity, which is special to one dimension. But in principle, so kind of on, on the bright side, it's easy to kind of formulate the question and you can write down a particle system which you know, it's supposed to give you existence in two dimensions of this frontier, just that the analysis will be much harder. So, so it's clear kind of how you should attack the problem, but that there are a lot of technical difficulties which do not arise in one dimension, but will arise in two dimensions. In relation to the video you showed, is it true that capital T corresponds to the time that everything freezes? Um, so, so in terms of the video, basically what you should think of is, um, so, so what I showed you in the video is, roughly speaking, a situation where capital T is equal to zero. So we're already at time zero, you have this very fast kind of leap or advancement of the ice. So, um, so, so there is a group in Oxford which uh, actually runs the sort of experiments on supercooled liquids, 
and so you can kind of prepare a very you, you know basically any desirable any desired um, temperature distribution in your supercooled liquid and, and see what happens and so then you can create situations where initially the freezing is kind of slow and, and you really see kind of this uh, regular behavior and then from time to time you will see that the ice is growing in real time so um, so so this so so then the capital T would be kind of the first time that you see with your naked eye that the ice is growing, roughly speaking. Uh, and C uh, depends only on the liquid itself. It's, uh... Uh, yeah, C right. So it depends uh, on the uh, on the liquid, and uh, it depends on how you prepare the liquid. So, for example, you can create these super cold liquids also by um, you know, putting uh, them under high pressure. So, so it basically depends on the conditions of your experiment and the particular liquid that you're looking at. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, uh, okay, so we'll have a coffee break and then we'll uh, resume at um, 11.30. Let's thank you.